And I had to learn all over how to do it. The, the thing I like about a physical book is when I sit down in my chair, the book's right there. And I think, oh, I got to read exactly. a few more chapters. If it's if it's in the Kindle app and I don't, you know, I'm just not thinking about it, then it's hard to get my mind over to the Kindle app to read the book. Right. But if it's sitting right by my chair, then it's it's there and I see it and think, yep, I got to do that. Right. What we found was that people who have <laughs> who are reading a book for fun, Kindle's fine. But if you're reading a book, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, oh, got something in my throat. Um, if you're reading a book to learn something, we teach about dementia. Um, you want a book, a book you can write in, um, especially people our age. Yeah, but Helen, once they put the book down, can they remember where they put it down at? <laughs> if well, I there pick is up, that, but I lose my Kindle too. <laughs> if I pick up a book or a newspaper, within two minutes I'm sound asleep. If it's on a computer, I can sit there all day long and read it. So for me, something written in a book or in a newspaper, that's good for going to sleep. It's not good for learning. I much prefer reading on a Kindle than I do a, a physical book. I'll I don't. I don't even use physical books anymore. That's why you publish it in both forms. <laughs> Ron, take over. Sure, got it. Yeah, so a book is a 3D printed text file, right? Say again, Steve. A book. A book is a 3D printed text file. Oh. <laughs> hey, Ron, how did everything go with your daughters when they came home for the quick visit vacation? They haven't come yet. They're coming uh, another oh. two weeks. On the 18th of June, they will be arriving with um, with uh, grandchildren and dog. Oh my. So did they fly over the polar route? They haven't flown anywhere yet. But they, know when uh, they fly, do they do a direct flight? Uh, they're coming, uh, the, uh, Korea, they're doing, the, they're going from China to Korea and then Korea to Vancouver. So, uh, they'll be, uh, I guess they'll come up probably around Alaska and down. I think that's the circle route they're going to use. I think I'm not sure. I haven't flown that route before, but, um, anyway, uh, yes, that'll be on the, that's why Huey's doing, Huey will be doing the following two Mondays uh he'll be doing the 19th and the following week he'll be doing both of those because i'll be i'll be busy cooking breakfast are they shipping the puppy or the or is he riding in the passenger no they well they booked a booked a um a spot he, he won't be in the cabin but he he'll be on the uh vip pet section in the hold <laughs> <laughs> i guess it's all heated and yeah, um, you only have two spots for the, the the whole thing was the dog, right? And how how it's going to get pampered. So in this uh, Korean Airlines, they only have two spots for animal for dogs in this particular big plane, and and so it's a, it's I guess it's quite nice. So they they get quite pampered, and there's there's only two spots. So yeah, so I don't know. It's costing a lot of money for this damn dog. Yeah, our vet uh, told us when we flew our dogs to give them a uh, sedative, kind of let them relax, and they just kind of go to sleep for six hours. Was, yeah, the, the, the vet that they're dealing with doesn't believe in that, and so they're not, uh, they're not, they don't believe in sedation, so I don't know. Acupuncture, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I, whatever, whatever, so... We'll see, but they got to stop in Vancouver and they've got a layover in Vancouver for about three or four hours and then about a 20 minute flight over to our place. So I don't think that dog's going to want to get back in the plane. I think they've got another flight to come. So he's going to get out and they're going to do a little little uh, walk around. I don't know if he wants to get back in. We'll see how it all works out. Is he going to Ethiopia? Yes. Oh dear, bless his heart. How old is it? Uh, the dog's about three years old. Oh, okay. He is indeed. So he's got, uh, so he'll just be here for six weeks and then he's off again. So what, what kind of a dog is it? 
Uh, I have no idea. It's it's not that. It, it, I don't know. It's it's a dog. Like like I'm not into dogs, so I have no idea. It's a it's a mixture of whatever. But but it's had like two years of of shots and and this and that and everything and it's uh, it's uh, it's it's vaccined up the hilt because of course they've got to they they don't want it to be in quarantine when it arrives so they've got to get all these things done so anyway wow. it's a big it's a big life revolves around the dog so I guess you <laughs> dog owners I guess that makes sense to you yes I guess it uh, your pets are. Um, yeah, oh, I can see. Kids. <laughs> they can't <write. laughs> Exactly. So anyway, welcome. Well, it's about quarter two. Let's. Uh, I I just want to. If you've brought a guest, let's uh, introduce our guest. I, I'm going to start because I yeah uh, I bought brought a, a guest of mine. Where's Where's Gord? It, as we introduce you, why don't Gord? Do you know how to put your hand up? Do you know how to raise your hand at the bottom? There you go. Put your hand up. Oh. Yeah, Gord's there. He's he's waving. Uh, Gord, of course, is uh, my guest today. Gord and I have been friends for there you go, uh, been friends for a very very long time. We we started together way back uh, in computers. Actually, I was a physician. He had a software company uh, that made uh, lab interfaces, and uh, he helped us out with a problem we had in our area here. His company came and we became good friends and then he retired and now I see him twice a week and every Sunday so uh and he's a pilot he flies around he's 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 my pilot friend I always talk about because he has a plane and he flies around all the time so um Gord is here as my guest today uh and welcome Gord Rose from Comox British Columbia there Thank you go much. there you go and he's a smart guy um now, does anyone else have a guest here that you want to introduce or you want to say hello to or whatever? Whatever. Does anyone have a have a guest? Any guests so far? That's it? Gord's the only guest? I'm the only guest. I'm special. There you go. <laughs> well. Well, my guess will be you know I can't win. We we have a contest, and and uh, those of you who read the newspaper uh, newsletter will know that you could win twenty five dollars, but it excludes um, it excludes any staff members at Tech for Seniors. So uh, <laughs> maybe no one's going to win the twenty five dollars. Anyway, all right. Well, we'll be starting in about 10 minutes. If you have any questions, comments, here, Carl, go ahead. Uh, maybe somebody, uh, Bob or uh, Huey, can explain this uh, two-factor authentication. When Google, I, I remember a couple months ago, I was very pleased when Google had a system of, uh, you know, uh, for two-factor authentication, and they would send you a message on your mobile phone and it would say, is this you? And you'd say yes, and that was it. Now they give you the choice of three numbers that you have to then select, which matches with a number uh, you know, on your website. I don't like that. I, I liked it when it was a lot easier. Now you have to do two steps. And now make matters worse, and this is where I'm coming from and trying to understand there's another question comes up. Do you want to save this uh, activity for some other? I don't remember the words because my memory is good, but it's very short. Uh, to save it to some other kind of system, yes or no? And half the time, I don't know how to answer that. It's some other authentication method. Somebody explain that. So, so I think, Carl, what you're talking about, and I'll just maybe, Bob, if you can agree with this or not but Bob, Carl what you're probably dealing with now is pass keys now what you were talking about before was a push notification that occurred to your phone and basically it would push the notification to your phone and say is this really you and you'd say yes and it would log you in and that could be on any computer it would send your phone the notification so you just say yes it's me and boom but now they've started yet another and we talked a lot about this but we we probably need to do some more videos about it 
but we uh, we they're now called pass keys and these are these are a, a code now that you can have but it's it's device specific and that's probably why it's asking if you want to save it to other devices and this is a new feature that Google has brought out right and so this is uh uh, instead of a push notification, you're right. It, it's a, it is a code that you have to enter in, uh, and and that would that allow you to get in. So it's called pass keys. Now there's lots of if you do a YouTube video, if you if you go on YouTube, there's lots of videos about pass keys that are that are that are there. So but this is a new feature in um, in um, new feature that uh, has just come out over the past, I guess, two or three months. Pass. Yeah, Ron, Ron, with the, the two-factor authentication, uh, now I've got some other programs that utilize the uh, uh, Google sign-in, and in order to not have to do the two-factor thing, they now have some kind of a system where you get a special code that you can put into that program as your password, and it's only good for that particular website. That's another way. That's another yeah. feature, right? But Carl, yeah, so, these are specifically related to Google and and not not the whole world, right? These are this is just a Google thing. Now, I I assume I'm pretty sure that you can still just do the push notifications. I haven't seen that, uh, and I, you must have turned on pass keys. Did you actually go into Google and turn on pass keys? Did you go into your security settings? No, no, I didn't do anything. Actually, it's it's a little more minutia than that. It started off with just a yes. And now then it went to uh, you got three numbers to choose from and you had to match the number on your phone with a number that was on the website. And there was always three. It was always a two digit right. number in the circle. Right. So then that worked. And then after that, there was a third pop up that said, do you want to save this authentication? I don't remember the exact words because my memory's short. But it, and then it says you want to save this for the future uh, authentication. Like it, you don't have to, somehow right. you would be better doing this. I don't understand that. Half the time I say yes. Half the time I say no. And uh, it's something third. I, I don't know what it is. It's a third pop up. Right. Uh, Car Carl, what I would do is I would uh, either do a screen capture when that pops up or, or write it down and then throw it into Bard and say, what does this mean? And I think it'll ex it, it'll, it'll try some exp explanations for you. And I would also That's what I would do, what I would do also, Carl, is is just go on YouTube and type in uh, Google pass keys. And you'll get, there's lots of videos made about it. There's tons of videos being made about this. We'll do some more. We're going to do some more. Uh, we'll, we're going to do some more about this in, in the future because it, it's a new feature that's just started with Google. And it may not be passkey. It may be still two-factor authentication. They may have changed what they're doing with it. And so. Yeah, it's hard uh, to know unless we actually see the screenshots. Yeah. A great idea, Carl. Yeah. I, yeah, I can do that or take a picture with my phone, but. Right. Uh, the uh, I I just wanted to bring it to your attention. It's not sh holding me up from doing anything. It's just it's a it's a double. It's almost like a triple authentication. I just well, want to bring it to your attention. I'll do yeah. more. Um, well, it's also important to know what it is because you don't want to say yes and give access to something that you don't want to give access to, right? Right. That that, that would be the worrisome part about that is that, and that's that's the thing I don't like, and I've sort of said this before that's what I don't like about push notifications and there was actually some uh, recently there's been some targeted uh, spam that goes to people who continually bombard requesting access to accounts and so you get all these notifications saying you know do you want to come in can, can do you want to let this person in do you want to let and you know people go on and on and on and then they forget and they get tired after a while and then they just hit the yes by mistake and boom they're into your account like you they have full access to your account once you hit that so push notifications are uh, you can just close out of them i mean it just it just means that someone's trying to access into your account or for, for me I, for me it's dash lane that kicks in when google or when there's a, a verification for the pass key then dash lane kicks in and I just 
allow it to happen. But dash lane is the one that sends the code and that gets me access to the account. Well, I, I just remember the word is save to authenticator. Yep. The word is authenticator and it says yes or no. And I've done it both ways, yes or no. It's the word that's authenticator. That's Microsoft. Yeah. That's Microsoft. That's a, yeah, look up Microsoft Authenticator and it'll give you some information. Yep. Well, well, that, it's already given me good information now that I know it's related to Microsoft, which sort of makes sense. They both are trying to uh, secure you, I guess. Um, Ron, I see some new names. I think you might want to ask for guests again. We're going to run out of a little bit of time here because we've only got about a couple of minutes. So let's just let me let everyone, we, um, the meeting will start in a couple of minutes. If you're a guest here, I want, we'll be cert certainly welcome you maybe a little bit later in the show. We'll see how the time goes, but we need to start the show in about, uh, about two minutes and I'll be muting everybody. And then we sort of have a regular format that we go through and you'll, all the guests will, uh, will see that. Uh, we'll, we'll keep everybody muted through the show. And if you want to speak or, or whatever, you can raise up your hand. But we like to, um, we have a sort of a fixed format for the show. And you'll see that as we, we go along. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll be starting pretty close. Well, I'm going to start it now, actually, so we have lots of time. So as, as so I'm going to be muting everybody. And then you'll see how, how things go as we head along here. All right. All right, Tech for Senior. This is Tech for Senior. I'm Ron Brown. I'll be your host today. This is um, June the 5th, 2023. I want to welcome everyone that's here today. Thank you for coming. It's your energy that keeps the show going. I want to welcome our guests. If you are watching this as a YouTube, um, as a YouTube, if you're over on YouTube watching this, because we stream it out to YouTube, thank you for watching. If you're watching this as a YouTube short, just click the link and it'll take you uh, right to the show. We'll be with you for about an hour, and then at top of the hour, we'll start our Q&A. Following our Q&A, we have a, uh, a, a video for you called a premiere video, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In the show today, we're going to Initially, we're going to talk, Bob's going to do his security news update. We have a special guest. We have uh, Carol Baxter here today, and she's going to talk on um, tools to write your story. And we'll, uh, and I have a video and we'll play that. She's, uh, and she'll be here to answer your questions. Then, uh, of course, we have uh, Bill James here today talking about the differences between uh, a Mac and Windows OS. And uh, uh, boy, a number of people in our uh, our show have uh, have got Macs, so we're we're looking at both uh, both operating systems now. And then, of course, uh, Ray will do his uh, music outro. Then we'll have a Q and A uh, from about top of the hour for about twenty minutes, and then we're going to um, have our premiere video, uh, which of course uh, this is a video that we play on YouTube, and it's uh, pre recorded from material that we've had in the past. So, uh, but it uh, the premiere means that it, it it's scheduled and will start at half past the hour. And the link is in our Saturday newsletter. So if you are a guest here, 
uh, you you like the show or you want to learn more about who we are, what you can do is just go to our newsletter, www, uh, and you can sign up at www.techforsenior.com. And we send that out on Tuesdays and Saturdays. It's free. We don't sell your name to anybody. There's no advertising. It's just, uh, it's, uh, um, and it's our newsletter. So the premiere video today that uh, I know that you'll all be excited about is about cooking. <laughs> it's not about technology. It's about cooking. And I'm going to talk about all the cooking channels that I watch. So this is, uh, it, it's all about cooking. And then Huey is going to talk about a taste atlas. Uh, so he's going to talk about one of his websites of the week, and this is about cooking as well. And then Bob's going to tell you how to make music while you're cooking. So you can actually make your own music up as you're cooking. So the uh, the, the premiere video today will be all about, so all you budding cooks and everybody that's interested in that, then you can certainly um, come along and uh, have a good time. And that will be at half past the hour. And I'll be putting the uh, link in the chat uh, as we go through as we go through the show. Now, uh, for, just to bring up the uh, Saturday newsletter, I wanted to let everybody know, for those of you who have brought guests today, thank you so much for bringing them. Uh, we have, of course, a contest on. And some lucky person who brought a guest today will be able to uh, win $25. And you're going to say, well, how do we enter the contest? Well, the uh, the details, of course, were in the Saturday newsletter. You have to read the Saturday letter to find out how to do that. And so then you'll be able to uh, enter it in. And, and about 7 p.m. my time locally here uh, to this evening, uh, I'm going to... Uh, take the names and put them in a hat and my very honest wife is going to draw one of those out and uh, I'll be announcing that in the newsletter tomorrow on who won the gift certificate and that of course is an Amazon gift certificate and I'll be sending that out to who to the email address that you use to enter the contest. Uh, for those of you also who read the Saturday newsletter I put in my um, my uh, favorite YouTube channel of the week and the channel of last week, uh, the channel was um, was on Linus Tech Tips. And for those of you who uh, who don't know uh, what that channel is, the channel is in our Saturday newsletter. But I thought it was quite interesting because uh, in 2008, they started the channel and it's about technology and tech tips, a lot like Tech for Senior, I guess. And they started and grew and grew and grew and they now have 15.8 million subscribers. <laughs> and so the, the head of the um, of the group decided to step down. They have a big staff and a lot of a lot of people contributing over the over the um, over the whole world to, to, to make this channel so big and successful. And he said that uh, he's stepping down and he had a solid offer which he had to give to their board of directors for and their offer for buying the channel was for 100 million dollars and they decided to decline that and continue on with what they're doing because they like it so much uh, so it's called linus tech tips and i put the link in the uh, they, they produce about 30 or 40 videos a week on technology so they're doing a pretty big job of it so if you are interested in technology have a look at that and it's uh, it's a very interesting interesting site don't forget that we also have a a um a show on thursday the show is of course tech for senior live and that's where the gang gets together the week and this is a broadcast meeting on uh, youtube or facebook just, just waiting for my internet to come back there so it's broadcast out either onto youtube or facebook uh and it's uh, again you'll find the link to the show on our website, www.techforsenior.com. Now, let me introduce everybody while we're here. I'm just gonna remove my spotlight here and come back here. And I'd like to introduce, of course, uh, my co-host today, uh, Huey Popluck, who uh, we alternate back and forth uh, in, in um, hosting the event. Huey, how's your week going? Uh, very well, uh, been real busy trying to keep up with this AI stuff and uh, uh, and do all the other things that I do. 
But uh, yeah, I'm here. Very good. And uh, Bob, did you get your car going? Uh, yeah, the mechanic was here. He got it started. It's now running. Hopefully the battery will just keep it going. And when we finish the show, the car will go to his shop and we'll find out what's the matter with it. Something left on or the battery itself, time for a new one. We'll find out. But the car right now is running. Very good. Very good. And uh, Ray, you're here. And uh, Carol, I imagine, is in the audience now. Carol is. I, I decided to bring my best friend today. Right. Who happens to be my wife and looking forward to I have not seen her presentation yet. Oh, so really? I'm, I'm looking forward to it as much as anybody else might be. All right. Well, we will we'll, we'll certainly talk to Carol in a few minutes. And uh, we look forward to that. Ray, of course, is our music uh, director for the show. For those of you who are guests here, Ray, uh, you'll see today um, his uh, music outro that he does. And it's always very popular. Ray's uh, been with us right pretty much since the show started. And so uh, so we have a lot of fun with his his, his music. He's always got some toe tapping, toe tapping music for us. Right, Ray? I try. I try. It's the hardest part, as I said before, is pleasing everybody all the time. So I, I think you do a pretty good job. I think you do a pretty <laughs> good job. <laughs> and Bill James. Unmute yourself. You're talking today, I think, aren't you? I am. And you you're you're on the dark side now. You're going to a <laughs> Mac. You are you're 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 leaving leaving uh, the 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 real world and going over into the into the Mac world. Is that right? Well, of sorts. Not 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 <laughs> uh, sort of have my uh, uh, one foot in and one foot out. Let's put it that all way. Right, all right. Well, we look forward to yeah, learning, uh, learning that, more about uh, it. Presentation interesting. Very good. And then, of course, we have Mike Ungerman, who's a regular on our show. Mike, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, you always have, Mike does a lot of work with EV cars. So a big part of our show, for those of you who are new here, is we do a regular series now on EV cars. And Mike also does solar electricity on his roof. He, he's always sitting with his car outside, and he's sitting in front of the car smiling because the solar panels are filling the car up. So he doesn't have to buy gas, right? So what? Where's the car? What's with this? Actually, it's parked out on the street because I have another car, which is a gas car. Oh, it, it's a Corvette, and ah. I took the Corvette out uh, for a car show over the weekend, and I forgot to bring it back up and put my right my uh, car, my Kia next to the charging facilities and charge it. I see. All right. Okay, because you're always sitting there in front of the car and you're always smiling. And uh, so that was, uh, I was wondering what was happening. All right, well, we uh, we look forward. You you actually will probably in another few weeks have another EV session for us, won't you? Yes, sir. We'll be talking uh, of the third in a series on charging, this time the apps that help to support mm -hmm. public charging. Excellent. Okay, that uh, sounds great. All right, we're going to move on now. Bob's going to do his security news update, and then we will get on with the show. Bob, take it away. You got it. Here is my security news roundup for the week ending June 2nd, 2023. Windows XP activation has been cracked, and it only took 21 years. One of the most controversial parts of the Windows XP launch was its implementation of Windows Product Activation, an anti-piracy measure that was responsible for plenty of bugs and headaches. Now, 21 years after Windows XP's arrival, its activation algorithm has been cracked. As reported by The Register, a blog post on tiny apps titled Windows XP Activation Game Over gives a brief history of attempts to crack the operating system's <laughs> activation process. Then it provides a hash for xpactivate32.exe, a program that lets you generate proper keys for offline Windows XP activation. Read more at reviewgeek.com. Don't click that zip file. Fisher's weaponized .zip domains to trick victims. A new phishing technique 
called File Archiver in the browser can be leveraged to emulate a File Archiver software in a web browser when a victim visits a .zip domain. With the phishing attack, you simulate a file archiver software, such as WinRAR, in the browser and use a .zip domain to make it appear more legitimate. Security researcher Mr. Docs disclosed last week, Threat actors, in a nutshell, could create a realistic-looking phishing landing page using HTML and CSS to mimic legitimate file archive software and host it on a .zip domain, thus elevating social engineering campaigns. Read more at thehackernews.com. Amazon to pay over 30 million to FTC settlements over Ring Alexa privacy violations. Amazon will pay the Federal Trade Commission more than 30 million to settle allegations of privacy lapses in its Alexa and Ring divisions. Amazon will pay the Federal Trade Commission more than 30 million to settle allegations for privacy lapses in its Alexa and Ring divisions, according to filings on Wednesday. The agency filed a lawsuit alleging Amazon's Ring doorbell unit violated a portion of the FTC Act that prohibits unfair or deceptive business practices, which Amazon settled by agreeing to pay $5.8 million. As part of the proposed settlement, Ring is required to delete any customer videos and data collected from an individual's face referred to as face embeddings, that it obtained prior to 2018. It must also delete any work products it derived from those videos. Read more at CNBC.com. Toyota's new data breach affects 260,000 car owners. It's been a wild few weeks for Toyota owners. If you happen to own a Toyota, you might want to keep reading, as the company has identified a data breach that affects hundreds of thousands of owners. The newly discovered exposed data includes in-vehicle device identifiers and mapping data shown on car navigation systems in Japan, as well as customer names and addresses for some cars sold in other countries. Customers who purchased Toyota vehicles as early as December 2007 may be affected if their data was exposed between February 2015 and May 2023. Read more at howtogeek.com. Kaspersky says attackers hacked staff iPhones with unknown malware. The Russian cybersecurity company Kaspersky said that hackers working for a government targeted several dozen employees' iPhones with unknown malware. On Thursday, Kaspersky announced the alleged cyber attack and published a technical report analyzing it, where the company admitted its analysis is not yet complete. The company said that the hackers who at this point are unknown, delivered the malware with a zero-click exploit via an iMessage attachment, and that all the events happened within a one to three minute time frame. Read more at TechCrunch.com. Avast detects new threats on the Chrome Web Store. Avast discovered 32 malicious extensions with a whopping 75 million combined installs that were available on the Chrome Web Store. The trickiest part about malicious browser extensions is the nature of the tools. The extensions themselves are designed to provide legitimate functionality, which makes them appear harmless at first glance. However, hidden within their code lies obfuscated code of malicious origin. At the time of the article's publication, the Avast team was still in the process of fully analyzing the threats that are attached to these malicious extensions. Read more on the Avast blog.
New Move It Transfer Zero Day Mass Exploited in Data Theft Attacks. Hackers are actively exploiting a zero day vulnerability in the Move It Transfer file transfer software to steal data from organizations. Move It Transfer is a managed file transfer solution developed by IP Switch, a subsidiary of US based Progress Software Corporation that allows the enterprise to securely transfer files between business, partners, and customers using SFTP, SCP, and HTTP based uploads. Progress Move It Transfer is offered as an open premise solution managed by the customer and a cloud SaaS platform managed by the developer. A company rep stated, if you are a Move It Transfer customer, it's extremely important that you take immediate action, as noted below, in order to help protect your Move It Transfer environment, while our team produces a patch. Read more at bleepingcomputer.com. This week's Must See on my YouTube channel. Grocery prices are higher than ever, and it's making shopping stressful. Here are some tips that can help you save money. Please watch my video on that topic at the link listed. Did you know? The original name for the search engine Google was Backrub. It was renamed Google after the Google which is the number 1 followed by 100 zeros. In 2014, there was a Tinder match in Antarctica. Two research scientists matched on the global dating app in the most remote part of the world. A man working at the United States station and a woman camping a 45-minute helicopter ride away. I also met my wife on the ice but not in Antarctica. To be a champ, you have to believe in yourself when nobody else will. Thanks to Sugar Ray Robinson. And that's a wrap for this week's Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye, and thanks. Well, thanks, Bob. The bad guys are at it again. Yeah, they're always at it. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, this time in the show, I want to introduce Carol Baxter to you. Is Ray, Carol, are you there? Can you raise your hand and then it just pops you up to the top? Do you not? Do you know how to do that? Can you go down to the bottom under um, um, and just just click on click, uh, click on reactions at the bottom, and you can raise your hand and that'll bring you uh, bring you right up to the top. There you go. Hey, there's Carol. Welcome. So uh, Carol, Carol has wrote me and she she wanted she gave me a bit of her bio. She said Carol Baxter is Ray's spouse. Uh, she adores her in-house tech support. Uh, so I guess she Ray keeps her <laughs> helps her with that. Uh, handmade quilts, home baked rolls, uh, and the meter of poetry filled Carol's childhood. And although it is a toss up as to whether the rolls or the poetry make the most impact. Since 2005, she has made her living in paint, print, sorry, in print as a successful grant writer, marketing, copywriter, editor, award-winning featured journalist, a memoir writer, and a truest family heirloom you can share with future generations. So we are so uh, honored and lucky to have you here, Carol. Thank uh, you now, for having me. I want to just, I have a question for you. I, I, you don't have to answer the question right now. I want you to think about it. But uh, I, I get an opportunity to introduce Ray all the time, right? And so on our Thursday show, I'm always introducing him. And in my dealings with people who have known Ray, they always say he's the nicest man you'll ever meet. And so when I introduce him on our Thursday show, I always introduce him as the nicest man you'll ever meet. So I guess 
you don't have to answer that right now, but I want your opinion as to why he's the nicest man you'll ever meet. We we don't we don't know that. And so we I thought I would ask you that question. I mean, we've been told that, but but I thought you could maybe maybe you could answer that question later. You don't have to answer it. I'll let you think about it for about 15 minutes. And then you can certainly you can certainly answer that question for me, and that would be great. All right, so I have your video and let's uh I'll get you to I'll play the video and then we'll have a chat with you, okay? <laughs> All right. Really? Hi, I'm Carol Baxter, and I am here to share with you some tools to write your life story or loved ones. Since 2008, I have been helping people write their life stories and then create it as a book that they can share with their loved ones. Are you interested? Let's begin. What's involved in writing a life story or a memoir for someone else? You need a desire to do it. Only you can tell your story exactly as you wish. As George Carlin said, you've got to want to. You need a vision. Who is your audience and what do you want to say to them? You need the time to do it. Set aside a consistent schedule to write, or trust me, it just doesn't happen. You need a deadline, perhaps. That's my ultimate inspiration. If it works for you, then set one. Tools. Well, I'm going to tell you about the many tools that I use, but if you want to make it easier on yourself, know that you can get away with Microsoft Word and from a company called Blurb, a software tool called BookWrite. Software and tools I use to capture a story. A handheld recorder, 15, 20 bucks on Amazon. When you're interviewing by phone, there really is no way to record that conversation unless you put your phone on speaker and have a handheld recorder turned on. Um, I like Zoom an awful lot. Um, I think you have eye contact with Zoom. It builds trust. You can record to the cloud or a computer. And for me, it makes it easier if I'm coaching a student. Um, I always have a notebook and pen to kind of make some highlights, jot down a quote that I want to make sure gets in the book. And then if I'm working from um, numbered questions, I can just write the number of the question and the answer to it. Um, a phone app. Um, when I'm sitting recording somebody face to face, it just saves it to my SD cards and makes it really easy to upload. I am the luckiest woman alive. I have in-house tech support named Ray Baxter and recently he informed me of Dictate and Transcribe. These are my two favorite new features. So we're going to talk about Transcribe first. Um, you get it to by clicking below the Dictate arrow. Now you can import those recordings of yourself or your loved one and their words are rendered into a Word document. This is machine transcription. It takes about 15 minutes for the system to transcribe a 90 minute interview. You have a choice of whether or not to use timestamps. I like timestamps when it's a long recording and I might have to go back and double check what somebody said. You will still have plenty of editing to do because guess what? People just don't speak the way they want to be read in a book. So my suggestion is that you have a second Word document that you use to create the story, cutting and pasting over from that transcribed one. I have dual screens that make this really easy. I'd be really, I think it would be a little tougher on, on one screen, but you can do it. Um, the alternates to Microsoft Word are Rev.com and Scrivy.com. They both do machine transcription for 10 to about 25 cents a word, significantly more, like 10 times more for human transcription. Transcribe is right under Dictate. It wants to upload an audio. This is about 20 minutes. It'll take about three minutes for it to render. As you can see, Transcribe does a pretty good job with the speakers and the timestamps. Rev and Scrivy that you pay for do a slightly better job, but again, you pay for them and this is free. When you go to add it to the document, you have lots of choices, just text with speakers, with timestamps, or with speakers and timestamps. So I'm just going to kind of scroll up from the bottom. This is speakers and timestamps. 
This is just timestamps. This is just speakers, which I actually sort of like a little bit better because this is a short one and it moves the speaker two into a more condensed version. And this is just text. Anyway, so you have lots of choices. When you go to save it, you just go up to file and save it where and how you want it saved. Microsoft Word's dictate feature is a beautiful thing, particularly if you have, like I do, my mother's handwritten life story. It's much faster for me to read that out and have Word render it than to sit and look at her handwriting and, ty and type it out. Um, there is a learning curve to use the commands, you know, period, comma, full stop, question mark, things like that, but it works pretty good. I've included a link for them, and I confess I'm not good at this yet, but here's an example. This is Microsoft Dictate. It shows right here in the ribbon. Mm -hmm. You just click on it to dictate. My papa ate stinky cheeses that I could barely pronounce, let alone spell, comma, Limburger, comma, Camembert, comma, and blue, period. I don't know where he'd have bought specialty cheeses in Mesa, comma, Arizona, comma, nor how our food budget would have stretched to include such delicacies in the early 1970s, comma, but I think he must have discovered a love for cheese in Europe during his World War II service, period. So you can see as it was typing Europe and World War II was not capitalized, but it went back in and did that. Um, there's lots of commands you can use to change paragraphs and what have you. I invite you to play with it. Ernest Hemingway famously said, write drunk, edit sober. Um, I definitely agree with the second part of that. Um, editing will set your book up for success. It only improves your story. It makes you feel good about sharing your story. Your readers will appreciate not stumbling over an extra word, a missing letter, or bad punctuation. And editing your story increases your chance that the reader will finish it. And you always want your reader to finish your book, right? Microsoft Word Style Editor is a wonderful thing. Um, there are three different modes to it, but casual and professional are the two that I generally take a look at when I'm working with fiction or memoir writing. Uh, I use spelling, grammar, clarity, conciseness, punctuation, conventions, and vocabulary. Uh, the scores you see here are for about a 38,000 word document that has not been edited yet. In order to pull this up in Microsoft Word, um, it's under the Edit tab. And then each time you click on one of these, whether casual writing, you click the down arrow, um, it'll give you suggestions within the document that you can choose to ignore or change as you wish. Inclusiveness is probably the only thing that I'm not super fond of um, as far as an editing tool. For instance, my client said I was gangly and a tomboy, much to my mother's dismay. Uh, you as the writer are the person who decides what words to use, and it is a memoir, so in my uh, humble opinion, you might want to capture how the person speaks and the time they lived it. Once you've written and given your story the once over, you might be wondering what's next. Well, I can recommend a couple of things. You can either DIY edit it yourself because all those little AI edits in Word are only gonna take you so far. If you're gonna do that, I recommend you print out your story, you edit it again, and you're gonna catch things on that printed page that you will never ever catch on the computer screen. You might even wanna read it in reverse just because that slows you down reading it. And by reading it in reverse, I don't mean the last sentence to the first sentence. I'm talking about kind of the last chapter to the first chapter. Um, reading it aloud will help you catch other things that you may wanna make corrections on. Repeat these as necessary until you're satisfied. Your other option is, of course, to send your manuscript to a professional editor. That might be just for you want it done for, grammatic, for grammatical errors. 
checking, or you might want it copy edited for continuity and missing things. If you're going to write fiction, I highly recommend you get an edition of the Chicago Manual of Style. I'm currently using the online version, but I do have um, version 17 in book form. Sometimes that's faster to refer to than looking it up online. I also use a software called Perfect It because it integrates with Chicago Manual of Style. It handles abbreviations and makes them consistent. Same for capitalization. I can create a house style if I'm writing a book and I want it just a certain way. Um, it works for hyphens and dashes. It's consistent with the prefixers, numbers, factions, directions, things like that. Um, it catches spelling errors that are from and when it should be form, and I really like that because I've become a bit of a dyslexic typist. Um, these are my two favorite go-to programs when I'm doing a deep edit. So you want to include photos in your memoir. Great. I am a big believer that there should be photos in it. Look through your photos for some candid ones that aren't so staged because they will often tell your own stories. When you're pulling them from sticky or those vintage albums, carefully lift them because if they're glued on um, it and the glue it's still sticking, it may result in cracks or tears. Um, I recommend using a small post-it note to mark the pages with the photos you want and then just scan them directly from the album. You can use digital photographs that are on your phone or computer. Keep in mind that you're printing with these. So those photos need to be about 450 kilobytes and preferably at least a megabyte. Um, you can use your cell phone, but make sure when you're taking those photos with your cell phone of your albums that you have it set to the highest resolution because you're going to be printing these. And 77 kilobytes for a printed photo is about the size of your thumb when you go to print it. I use one of two tools for designing and building the book. Um, I either use Adobe InDesign or I have, I have something called BookWrite, which is from a company called Blurb. I've been printing with Blurb since 2008. Um, I find their customer service to be right on. I think their prices are great. And originally when I was using them, they handled text and photos the best. There are other printers out there that will print photo books for you. None of them, in my opinion, handle text as well as Blurb does. When you want a digital version of your memoir too, um, you need to decide if that means a PDF or an ebook. Those are often used interchangeably, but they are different. Um, a PDF is a printable document where an ebook is going to have flowable text. So if I'm using my InDesign file for the print book, I can create a PDF from that. If I'm using BookWrite, I can, I can create a PDF, but it's going to have a watermark on it. Um, as far as eBooks go, I use a program called Atticus because I can import my document either from Word or from the Atticus software and then manipulate it into chapters. And, and they have different templates and there's about 1,200 unique combinations, so it makes it kind of fun. If you would like some cheat sheets, you can email me, carol at talesofalifetime.net. I have a Begin Your Memoir With Me worksheet. There's a family legacy book with emails and instructions. There's a suggested photo list for your memoir. I have bespoke cookbook starting points. And I have a who, what, when, where, why homework assignment if you are so inclined to start writing. In the 15 years I've been writing memoirs, I've discovered it's kind of like that being that individual or couple's hairstylist or barber, bartender, and close friend rolled into one for about six months. I would be honored to be your avid listener, creative questioner, and your interval partner as we bring your story to the page. I truly appreciate your time and attention today. If I feel you think I can help you, please don't hesitate to reach out. My website is talesofalifetime.net. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Carol.
Excellent. Yep. Ron, you're muted. Ron is muted. I put all the links for everybody to the different programs I use, et cetera. Um, and in the chat, so. Good. Anybody? Thank you so much, Carol. Um, now I'm unmuted. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will, um, of course, uh, be, there'll be lots of questions, I'm sure. So will you be able to stay with us uh, till sure. the Q&A afterwards? Yeah, sure. Great. Did you, uh, in a nutshell, so why is Ray the nicest man you'll ever meet? Did you find uh, find an answer to that? Or? <laughs> um, he, he met all, he's just kind. He's funny. He's the perfect guy for me. And he's blushing <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> okay. um, he's just, he's nice to people. He always offers to help. And All right. So I'm going to continue introducing him on our Thursday show as the nicest man you'll ever meet. <laughs> All right. How much? I'm the, he, 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 being married to him means I'm the luckiest woman on the planet. And I'll <laughs> argue that with anybody. So. Okay, thanks, Carol, a lot. We look forward to seeing you in the uh, Q&A afterwards. <laughs> All right, let me introduce uh, Bill James. Bill James, of course, is uh, 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 he is a man of many talents. Uh, he, he uh, of course, does, does our gadget uh, section in our Tuesday newsletter, but he is a lot more than just a gadget guy. He's a man that knows operating systems, and he frequently talks about Windows operating systems, and we put him to task learning the Mac operating system because we wanted to do more, learn more about this. And here he is today going to tell us a little bit more about the Mac OS. Take it away, Bill. No audio. He's, he's muted. Windows and Mac OS, Bridging the Gap, Exploring Similarities and Shared Features. When it comes to computer operating systems, Windows and Mac OS have long been seen as rivals, each with its own unique features and design. However, amidst their differences, there are intriguing similarities that are worth exploring. Apple and Microsoft have a long history of, of competition in the technology industry. The rivalry between the two companies date back to the early days of personal computing. Despite their distinct interfaces and underlying architectures, Windows and Mac OS share common ground in terms of functionality and user experience. In the 1980s, Apple's and Microsoft were competitors in the emerging market for personal computers. Apple's co-founder Steve Jobs and Microsoft's co-founder Bill Gates were both key figures in shaping the industry. At that time, Apple's Macintosh computers were known for their user-friendly interface and innovative design, while Microsoft focused on software development, particularly the MS-DOS operating system. The competition between Apple and Microsoft intensified when Microsoft released a graphical user interface similar to that of the Macintosh in the 90s. That led to legal disputes between the two companies over copyright infringement. The lawsuits lasted for several years with Apple claiming that Microsoft copied elements of its operating system. Throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, Apple struggled financially and Microsoft dominated the market with its Windows operating system. However, Apple made a significant turnaround with the introduction of the iMac, followed by the iPad, iPhone, and iPad. I said iPod, iPhone, and iPad, which propelled the company's success. In recent years, Apple and Microsoft have both diversified their products portfolio and expanded into various areas of technology, including smartphones, tablets, and cloud services. While they are still competitors in certain sectors, the nature of their competition has evolved, and they also collaborate on various projects. For example, 
Microsoft Office apps are available on Apple Mac OS and iOS platforms, and the Apple Music service is accessible on Micro Windows operating systems. Overall, the competition between Apple and Microsoft has been prominent uh, has been a prominent aspect of the technology industry, driving innovation and shaping the development of personal computing, computing with Windows and Mac operating systems. In this presentation, we will delve into the fascinating parallels between the two operating systems, highlighting how their functions converge and offer insights into the benefits of their shared features. We'll start with the command key on Mac OS and the Windows key. The Windows key is primarily used for opening the start menu, while, which provides quick access to programs, files, and system settings. It also plays a role in the various Windows specific keyboard shortcuts. On the other hand, the command key on the Mac acts as a modifier key, similar to the control key on Windows. It is commonly used in combination with other keys to perform various actions and keyboard shortcuts within applications. Looking at the keyboard symbols and placement, on the Mac, the command key is represented by this little squiggly star symbol and is typically located on either the side of the space bar on Apple keyboards. In Windows, the Windows key is usually labeled with the Windows logo and is typically located between the control and Alt key on the Windows keyboard. If you look at the Mac keyboard, you notice the command keys that are on either side of the space bar. And in the Windows, we'll notice that the Windows key is located between the control and Alt keys on the Windows desktop keyboard. The command key on the Mac OS and the Windows key often labeled with the Windows logo on the Windows keyboard serve similar functions, but have some key differences. While the Windows key is used in some keyboard shortcuts, for instance, Windows key plus L to lock the computer, Windows key plus D to show the desktop, Windows shortcuts typically involve the control or all keys as a primary modifier. In the Mac OS, the command key is frequently used to execute system level commands, such as command plus Q to quit the, an application, command plus S to save a file, and command plus space to open the spotlight search. The command key on Mac OS is extensively used for Windows management. For example, Command plus N opens a new window, Command plus W closes the active window, and Command plus Tab switches between open applications. In Mac OS, many application specific shortcuts use the command key. For instance, new browser tab in the Mac OS Command plus T, Windows, it is Control plus T. So you can see where the correlation is. It's something interesting to note that Macs do not support touchscreen. So learning the shortcuts is something that you might want to learn if because you're gonna be tied to the keyboard or to the mouse. You can Google for a complete list of the Mac OS shortcuts uh, versus Windows shortcuts. The Option key on the Mac OS and the Windows Alt key. On the Mac keyboard, the Option key serves several functions and is often used in combination with other keys to access additional features and shortcuts. The Windows equivalent of the Option key on a Mac keyboard is the Alt key. The Alt key on a Windows keyboard functions similarly to the Option key on a Mac. It can be used for entering special characters accessing alternate menu options, and a modifier key for various shortcuts. The option key is represented by this symbol, which is kind of a line which looks like an L below, and is typically located on either side, left and right, of the command key on Apple keyboards. 
However, it's worth noting that specific Mac keyboard shortcuts or functions involving the option key may not have a direct equivalent on Windows keyboards. And here is a, the keyboard uh, that shows the option keys. So if we want to talk about some additional similarities and shared features, while Mac OS and Windows have different keyboard shortcuts by default, there are some shortcuts that have similar functions or perform similar actions on both operating systems. For example, copy. Windows uses, Windows uses Control plus C to copy selected files or text, while on the Mac uses Command plus C for the same purpose. The paste option, Windows uses Control plus V to paste copy text or files, while the Mac uses Command plus V for the same action. To undo, Windows uses Control plus Z to undo the previous action, while the Mac OS uses Command plus Z for the same thing. If you want to select all, in Windows, you use a Control plus A. In the Mac, you use Command plus A for the same function. The cut function, you use control X to select text and files, while on the Mac you use command plus X for the same action. To print on Windows, in Windows you use control plus P to cut selected files or to, to select text or, fi or files, while in Mac you use the command plus P for the same action. To save a document, you in Windows you use control plus S, in the Mac, you use Command plus X for the same action. These are only a few instances of keyboard shortcuts that work similarly under Windows and Mac OS. It's important to remember that each operating system has a variety of additional keyboard shortcuts. Functions in Mac OS that are identical to those in Windows. There are several functions in the Mac OS that are identical. For instance, the File Explorer Finder uh, in a Mac, both Windows and Mac OS have a file management system that allows you to navigate through files and folders, search for specific items, and perform actions such as copying, moving, and deleting files. The word processors in both operating systems offer processing word processing software. Windows has Microsoft Word, while Mac OS has Pages. The applications have similar features for creating, editing, and formatting text documents. The big difference between the uh, Mac and Windows is that within the Mac, the word processing software is included in the operating system, where in the Windows, it is a feature you have to purchase, although there are uh, a couple built-in WordPress is called WordPad, which would be the equivalent of Pages. In the email client area, Windows has Microsoft Outlook. Mac uses Apple Mail. Both applications serve as email clients allowing users to manage their email accounts and receive messages and organizes their inbox. In popular web browsers like Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Edge, are available for both Windows and Macs. Clear, to clear your web browsing history, for instance, the shortcut for Windows is Control plus Shift plus Delete. In Mac, it is Command plus Shift plus Delete. Both systems offer multitasking, allow users to run multiple applications simultaneously. Users can switch between different applications, arrange windows on the screen, work on multiple tasks at the same time. Both systems offer multiple desktops that allow you to run applications on different apps, desktops. Users can switch between different desktops, arrange windows on the screen, and work on multiple tasks at the same time. There are numerous other applications that are compatible. Google Chrome, um, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Office, Adobe Photoshop, VLC Media Player, Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, 
Both systems have calendars and calculators and other widgets that are available in their app stores and Microsoft stores that work similarly to the products that are also available uh, in both operating systems. Also, Zoom, a popular team collaborative communication tool, works for both systems. I'm using Zoom here uh, as I give this presentation. Slack is another popular team collaboration, Evernote, and of course, TurboTax. These are just a few cases that numerous other software programs that are cross-platform compatible with both Mac OS and Windows, enabling users to switch between operating systems while utilizing their chosen programs. So the best of both worlds as an alternative, whether you need to run Windows programs that don't have Mac versions, or you're making the switch between PC and a Mac and need to transfer your data or software, there's a software called Parallels Desktop for Mac that allows you to run Windows and Mac OS simultaneously on a Mac. You can run Windows on your Intel or Apple M series. It, we, it allows seamless copying and pasting. It is optimized for the latest Windows 11 and Mac OS Ventura operating systems. It is developed and tested across multiple OS in a virtual machine for the Mac. And it includes a toolbox, but over 40 one-touch tools for Mac and the PC. So in conclusion, while Windows and Mac OS may have their unique strengths and fan bases, it's important to realize the com commonalities that exist be beneath the surface. From the user interface to file management, internet browsing, productivity tools and accessibility features, these two operating systems share more similarities than meet the eye. Whether you need to run Windows programs that don't have Mac versions or you're making the switch from Mac to Mac, from PC to Mac, and need to transfer your data or software, you might consider Parallels Desktop for Mac, which allows you to run Windows and Mac OS simultaneously on your Mac. These, there are some key differences between the command key on a Mac OS and the Windows key on a Windows keyboard. It's worth noting that some specific Mac keyboard shortcuts or functions involving the option key may not have a direct equivalence on the Windows keyboard. By understanding and appreciating the common factions of the two operating systems, we can broaden our perspective, make informed choices, and leverage the best of both worlds to enhance our computing experience. Sources for some further reading, Mac World, Mac versus PC, another article, PC World, Mac OS versus Windows, which operating system is really better? So thank you. I'm Bill James, Tech for Seniors. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> That was uh, uh, some really good information. Thank we you. Are, and, and you'll be around then. Oh, uh, yes, I'll be here. For the Q&A so people can ask some questions. That's great. Uh, before I introduce uh, the nicest man in the world, uh, I want to just uh, say goodbye to those over on our um, YouTube feed. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for watching. At this time, we're going to move into Ray's music outro. And that, of course, uh, uh, will just be broadcast on our own Zoom meeting. So if you want to pop over and ask Carol some questions or participate in the meeting, we still have lots of room over on our Zoom meeting. Pop over here and we'll just let you in. Uh, so I'm going to stop that. Ray, uh, I guess we can. you can take